welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from the wonderful world of Shades of Vengeance, now coming to now coming to us with a definitive edition of Era the Empowered to celebrate its fifth anniversary, the one and only Ed Jowett. How are you doing today, man? I am doing great, and it's fantastic to be back in the temple, of course. Yep, thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on. Mm -hmm. um, I will admit this is a good opportunity because... I only briefly touched on the touched on the empowered the first time I had you on, and that was because I was trying to somehow cram um, like six or seven diff six or seven different games that you had done up to that point <laughs> uh, in one in one inter in one interview. So now I have the actual opportunity to focus on the empowered. So I suppose I'll, I suppose I'll start I'll start with the obvious. Um, Growing up, were you more of a Marvel guy or a DC guy, or neither? Uh, no, no, no. What? No. Well, kind of both. So, um, growing up, um, well, <laughs> it depends exactly what you're talking about. If you're talking about superheroes in general, I yeah. probably had more exposure to Marvel narrowly because I did watch the um, the DC Batman animated, Superman animated Justice League. Mm -hmm. I watched those. Um, and I also watched the the Spider Man, the Hulk, X Men, um, Iron Man, yeah, Silver Surfer. Those ones that that came out around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of reading comics, um, I didn't actually touch any Marvel or DC comics until much later in life. Uh, the uh, the first comic I I collected was uh, Sonic the Comic, which was a Sonic the Hedgehog comic mm -hmm. here in the UK. Um, done by a done by a company here in the UK. Yeah. Um, it went about 200 issues, and it was around uh, you know r right around the time it starts around the time Sonic was invented, and I was sort of the right age and very very much enjoyed that. I uh, religiously collected them as religiously as a sort of seven eight year old can. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the f I wouldn't be surprised if. The fact that the, that you probably were able to get those comics at, at like newsstands and and small t and small time yeah. stores, um, that can yeah. that can certainly help. That's that's the reason why um, the why the big why the biggest independent still is um, Archie, because of the fact yeah. that that's in grocery stores and newsstands more than dedicated comic shops. And fun fact, Archie also did a Sonic comic. Yep. Um. Uh, back at the back of that. In fact, I think they still are, but I'm not entirely sure. I've got a friend who who knows a lot more about this than I do, mm -hmm. um, in terms of who does what comics. Yeah, he's a uh, he's a big fan of the new IDW. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, Irony Empowered. Yeah. So, um, shifting into shifting into that, <laughs> um, because in order to even get to that, we do have to get we do have to get into kind of the origin origin story of things. Um, what what was your first introduction to the idea of a superhero RPG? Um, I actually didn't play a superhero. Well, ooh, okay, it depends how you define superhero RPG, right? Um, I would argue that you can play the Firefly RPG in a way that is basically a superhero RPG. Right. Well, it's because so the setting is quite high, but <laughs> are 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 we talking the are we talking the more recent one or are we talking the old Serenity one? Oh no no, no the old the old Serenity one the um uh the Margaret Weissman one. Well, they're they're both they're both under the purview of Margaret Weiss. It's just one was using uh, the uh, older version of okay, Cortex. The, Cortex system, the the old the old original one. This this would have been well over twenty years ago. Yeah, that would have been um, um that would have been the yeah, original that would have been, Cortex. Uh, the, the Oh. Yeah. No, not over. Only just about twenty years ago, actually. Not not mm -hmm. over twenty years ago. There we are. I feel yeah. a bit younger. The yeah, um, it, get, it gets a little confusing because yeah. originally that one was called Serenity, and I th I think the reason for that was because it um 
because they got the license from Universal and not Fox. Yes, yes, I think you're right. The movie was handled by Universal, and obviously yeah. the TV show was handled and buried by Fox. But uh, yes, <laughs> if I did, if I covered Fox's oh, mistakes. Yeah, my, my... My group played it, and um, the uh, the GM specifically prohibited from anyone uh, anyone from having telepathy and leaky brain pan. He said, "I'm not dealing with River." No, fair. I'm not doing it. <laughs> so fair enough. Mm -hmm. Um, so I only went for telepathy without the leaky brain pan. That's even worse. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> uh. So yeah, I mean, you you could argue that 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 is a superhero RPG. But actually, before I started researching for Era the Empowered to make it happen, I had never actually sat down and played a specifically superhero RPG. Now, obviously, part of my research process is, you know, to go out and, and play things. And um, I tried Silver Age Sentinels, and I tried Mutants and Masterminds, and I tried uh, the Face Rip Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Face Rip Marvel. Face Rip. Mm -hmm. um, everyone, everyone plays a Spider Man. That's why I call it Face Rip Spider Man. It's 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 bad habit. Um, so you know, I actually went out and started playing these games. Uh, I I was reasonably experienced with RPGs at the time, but um, yeah, no, I uh, I hadn't played a superhero RPG until I decided to make one. Mm -hmm. And part of the re part of the reason. I bring up I bring up that kind of thing is one of the things you do you do bring up is how there's a common problem of powers being unlocked be powers being locked behind um, roles and that's definitely the case um, the reason why I haven't covered any much in the way of supers RPGs <laughs> on my Valley of the Judge series is you have so you have so much of the books dedicated to just the power system. To the, to the point where it, it ends up having the same problem that some fantasy games have with way too many spells. Yep. And I'm guessing one, I'm guessing one of your design goals very early on was to try and work around that. Yeah, I mean, uh, what what you were saying about the roles is something I feel very strongly to be true. Um, having played many of these other games, I too often. I didn't feel like a superhero. I felt scared to use my powers. You know, I mm -hmm. I was worried that if I started flying, I might plummet to the ground and die. Or, um, you know, I, I was worried that if I if I tried to punch a wall, then my super strength might just fail. I might fail the roll and 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 break my hand. So I was scared to use my superpowers. But that's that's not the feel that you get from well, literally any superhero material. Okay, there are some individual characters who are worried about it. Uh, Rogue springs to mind. Obviously doesn't want to use her powers wherever possible. Um, but I, I, I wanted to make it feel like your power was part of you and it is natural to you as lifting a large object or, um, uh, I, I don't know, thinking through a problem. It should be as natural as that to use your superpower for a character. And that's why I came up with the power tree. That's why the base power is an attribute in the system. It's just another attribute. Mm -hmm. It's as it's as you know, natural as stamina or willpower or dexterity. Um, your, your power is just what you can do. And, and you can just do it to the degree that you put points into it, right? Like, like any other skill or, or any other attribute. Mm -hmm. And then you, you develop that by by pushing your power into sort of various different use it in various different ways. So, um, what's a good example? Uh, Jean Grey, mm -hmm. right? So she has telekinesis and telepathy, right? Okay, fair enough. She's already kind of a a, a slightly broken character before we even talk about the Phoenix Force. Um. Let's just handle the telekinesis so she can lift stuff. Yeah, and suddenly that turns into telekinetic blasts from her brain. Okay, that's cool. She's learned how to do that with her natural telekinesis. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. There is a skill. That's a skill that you have used to apply your natural ability to this situation. Okay, cool. 
and on that basis, I then followed through and just just made, okay, well, you could apply this skill in this way or this way or this way or this way and so on. And the power tree grows very naturally from that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I did not do as well as I would have liked in the original core rulebook is explain how to build your own power tree. Now, to be honest, it's about 50-50. Like, most people get it. Um, but uh, there are there are enough that are sort of uncertain when they do get it right, and then some people really don't get it at all and just can't can't work off what I've written. Um, so what I did is since I've written articles and 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 various other things on how to build a power tree, and I've I've significantly improved the way that I can explain this to people. So, you know, this is one of the major things that I want to add in the Definitive Edition rulebook here. Um, because, as you say, the power trees are really, really integral. But rather than having something that applies to every power tree or, or to multiple power trees, each power tree is built custom for the character that wants to use it. So that, again, means that um, while super luck and probability manipulation are literally the same thing, Theo, I mean it, they are. <laughs> um, uh, while they are literally the same thing, y you're, you're building the tree slightly differently with slightly different words, you know, a, a way of approaching it. Um, that, that was one of my characters, um, uh, sorry, one of my players uh, who wanted to build a character that had probability manipulation because he's a bit of a munchkin. And um, he uh, he complained that super luck is different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that is that is something I did notice. The way you have powers set up can be can potentially be a um, blank check design kind of thing. Um, what I mean by blank, what I mean by that is, well, ob obviously the blank check part. But when I use that term. Um, I'm referring to how that kind of... Th when you give players essentially a blank check, you can have a situation where, pe where people don't know where the line is. Oh, yes, this absolutely. Is, this, is um, why I'm, this is why I've always been so critical of the aspect system in, say, Fate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I totally understand that, and I... I've only played Fate a few times, but the first time I played it, I recall that I unintentionally absolutely destroyed the aspect system. Just, just, I, I, I didn't even mean to, but I was just writing stuff about my character, and they ended up being so applicable to every situation that I was always using an aspect. Mm -hmm. Um... That was far from intentional. I, I, you know, I didn't know what the session was going to be like when I, when I, when I created my character. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that caused some serious problems. So yeah, no, I totally get that. The there are two things, steps that I've taken in order to try and uh, deal with that. So first of all, improving the clarity of the instructions. Yep, absolutely. Um, that's that's important. Secondly, um, I'm adding a significant number more powers to the uh, uh, to the examples in the in the definitive edition rulebook. I have only been asked for four things that didn't already exist in five years. I've only been asked about four things that didn't exist. Uh, and again, okay, fine. So it says fire control, but if you want to do frost control instead, it's literally the same thing and you can just kind of like go, yeah, yeah, okay, I see how that works. Um... Or super mm. luck and probability manipulation or whatever. So I'm not counting those as some of the things. I've been asked for very, very few things that actually I didn't have anything to support. Mm. Um, I've come up with minor differences, you know, a, a cyborg with laser guns and a cyborg with a giant hook that it's uh, uh, that, it, that it whirls around its head and hits things with. Um, you know, minor variations also exist, you know. Um... I think that at the end of the day, it's, you know, if the GM is not comfortable saying, yes, I feel like that's balanced, encourage them to use one of the examples in the book. Because the examples in the book cover basically anything you could want. Mm. Most people 
my experience of most people is they can't really come up with a superpower. Like if you go, okay, you're going to play a character, which what what super what superpower do you want to have? They most people fall into one of about twenty different things. Um, you know, the Munchkins go, well, I'll be a power copier. Okay, sorted, no problem. Uh, you know, fire control, very common. Um, flying, super strength. Um, martial arts. Um, you you know, um, Iron Fist, Batman, whoever. You know, it's they 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 pick their favorite hero and say, I want to do those things. Mm -hmm. And something else that is that is a common pitfall that I see with superhero RPGs that I think I think is um, tackled here is something is something that is kind of a conflict between the experience of playing a superhero and the way people look at RPGs, and that is you look at superheroes in the comics, you don't really have them leveling up all that often. You have side oh. grades, you have temporary stuff more often than not, but not a straight-up upgrade that sticks. Oh, I don't know. Uh, the Silver Age of comics and Superman would disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but the Silver Age is drugs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay, fine. But, but the reality is that most superheroes you see in the comics... They're not level one superheroes, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're, um, a really good example is Blue Beetle in the Young Justice cartoon, right? So he kicks off as really not that great, and he gradually sort of learns to do bigger and bigger things. That is literally leveling up. Yeah. That's exactly what he's doing right there, mm -hmm. right? Um. You, you, you. Um, I gave you the example of Jean Grey, who initially did not have have that ability. Um, you know, you you can obviously then easily do things like power copiers, like Rogue or or um, Peter Petrelli from yeah. Heroes. Um, you know, yes, and those are temporary, right? And those are deliberately temporary. Mm -hmm. But um, again, in Heroes, it's another really good example of a series that that absolutely dealt with improving their powers as time went on. Um, you know, with the exception of sort of Silar, basically, everyone improves their powers over time. Uh, Silar just has the ability to do these things, and and it never really changes. Yeah. But um, Hiro Nakamura, um, you know, he, he initially he can travel through time, then he can stop time, then he, you know, and and he learns to apply his ability in different ways. Um, he learns to control it more, so it's not just random. That's the kind of leveling up that I, I I think I think is actually delivered in most things. I mean, even if you look at um, Spider Man from uh, uh, the Sam Raimi movies, to take an example. So in the first movie, you know he's 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 strong. He he can web swing and whatever. And then in the second movie, he is definitely stronger than he was in the first movie. Like like look at the actual things that he did and what he struggled with versus what he didn't. He is definitely stronger. He's grown. By the third movie, yeah, he... he okay, fine, Venom suit. Okay. he He's grown again, though. And and, and you can see that happening with most heroes in, in most situations. You even see it in the comics. You see, oh, wow, I had no idea I could do this. Or I came up with a new application for my super speed. Uh, I did that in one of our one of our comics. Um, I have a... I mentioned Sonic the Hedgehog earlier. I have a speedster called Blue Shift, uh, who mm. is blue and a speedster. In no way is this a reference to Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> um, uh, but basically, she realizes that um, not only can she run fast, she can actually think fast as well. It just takes a different set of muscles. She has to sort of work out how to do it and then apply it deliberately when she wants to. Mm. It's yeah, it's quite, it's 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 quite a weird criticism from my perspective because I can find it in nearly everything. Um, you know, Batman develops a new gadget. Um, uh, uh, Batman the animated series. I was just watching it recently. Um, I've been looking for inspiration for some uh, new sessions I'm going to be writing in November, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, he uh, he he 
suddenly out of nowhere suddenly starts using electrical electrical batarangs or electrical knuckle dusters. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like that's like ten episodes in before you ever see it the first time, and there would have been occasions where it would have been useful. Mm-hmm. Clearly, you know, clearly there was, you know, there was some reasoning there. Um, that would be a level up for me. So yeah, if 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 someone said, "Oh, I don't really see people leveling up." Um, I mean, my favorite Marvel hero is Iron Man. Um, every every new suit is a level up. And at least the one. the thing that level the thing up. that ends up getting tricky in in some is when do, when doing gradual upgrading of making sure of making sure that say a street level hero is able to is able to stay within that relative area, not having say um, Luke Cage and Iron Fi- Iron Fist all all of a sudden do all of a sudden doing Avengers level stuff. The thing Cage and Iron Fist are. Completely capable of doing Avengers level. Yeah, stuff. Um, yeah, not like, the not the best example, I admit. Are, um, but but I mean, there are not very many which, like, there are Avengers who are not very powerful. Wasp comes to mind, mm-hmm. right? She she's not a very powerful. Like, in, I'm I'm talking about Avengers comics here. Yeah. Um, she's not very powerful. That's that's the truth. She doesn't need to be. She brings other things to the team. But if you compare almost any Marvel character against Wasp, they are more powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a, a street level, I I really like the... Um, the I, I, I go off that very first episode of Justice League Unlimited, which is when they changed the Justice League cartoon from just the, the seven of them into, like... Dozens or hundreds. I'm not even sure how many there are. <coughs> <coughs> and um, they approach Green Arrow, and Green Arrow says, "Oh no, you know what? I'm I'm not interested in the huge world-ending threats. You know, you go fight the aliens. I'm going to look after the little guy. That's what I do." Mm-hmm. And Batman says, "Funny thing about these huge threats, they tend to stomp on the little guy." That that to me is the difference between a street level hero and a and, a, and an Avengers level hero, it's a choice. Falcon, seriously, I I, I mean I, I like the character fine, but he sucks. Like his power is is crap. Mm-hmm. Um, relatively speaking, to 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 most most members of the Avengers, but he's a member of the Avengers because it makes sense for him, for his character, for the ensemble that they're writing or whatever. He could easily be a street level hero. It's just a choice that people make. That's mm-hmm. that's my opinion. Yeah. Now, with I do think that that's that's not as much of an issue that um, the era system in general and and empowered is go, is going to have to is going to have to deal with because of how you ha- how you have that tree system and just how um, yeah. just to, just how upgrades end up working. Mm-hmm. In ge- in general, oh. yeah. I mean, you you'll upgrade at a rate, and your enemies will become more powerful at a similar rate, presumably. Mm-hmm. So you don't end up going right. Well, I'm a cosmic level hero, and I'm a I'm a I'm a street level hero. Mm-hmm. In instead, you it, it depends a little bit on the kind of scenario that you're that you're working in. In theory, any hero could be quite easily upgraded to a cosmic level hero by, say, adding a second power tree when they level up, or by um, e- even just pumping lots and lots of points into their power tree. They they can become very very powerful. Whereas uh, you can have also a, a street level gravity controller who can sort of in a meter squared maybe make someone float. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's about it. Like rev- zero gravity on them, rather than uh, rather than like they fly up into the sky for you know a thousand miles and suffocate in fa- in space. Yeah. Um, now, when when you <coughs> said that you wanted to better def- better define the na- the na- the nature of um power of um the power tr- the power tree setup, um, I'm guessing that 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 applies just as much to the fir- to the first tier 
as much as to the second and third tier as far as suggestions absolutely um it's it's the base power is seldom a problem um the the thing that i find people struggle with is how powerful should my skills be and um unsurprisingly perhaps i find that people who have an existing familiarity with the era d10 rule set have less trouble with this um because they understand right okay well i sort of understand how powerful persuasion is or or brawl or or larceny so okay so i get a rough idea of of how powerful these sorts of skills are that would be like a okay cool okay i can now start to put these things together also i'm i'm also hopeful that on top of obviously defining it better mm -hmm. i'm hopeful that providing more examples is also helpful because most people can find something that is similar to what they want. Mm -hmm. And if you more or less have what you want, then then the leap to just tweak it to what you do actually want is much smaller. Um, th that's, a, you know, that's a really good thing for a GM, for the player who's trying to make the character and so on. It's going to help them make sure that they're happy with what what's going on. Mm -hmm. And within the within that, I think it I think it'd be bet I think the best analogy based on how you describe it when it comes to the power skill system is that your is that what you're developing is not how powerful the the skill is per se but um f but discovering new ways to use it so the power itself is as i say just part of you it's a natural ability mm -hmm. and then the skills the power development areas are basically skills that are right i understand so if you imagine it with a a, a, a you know a, a more commonly used skill right so you go in with some charisma Mm -hmm. But you have no experience in persuading anyone about anything, right? So you go in and you smile and you're nice to them and you go, hey, um, you know, could, could you do this thing for me? Because, you know, I, I think it'd be really nice. And they go, mm, uh, well, no, no, I, I, I don't think so. But if you go in and you're like, right, I know how to persuade someone. I need to find something they want. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to go, right. If you do this thing for me, I'll do this thing for you, and then we'll both be better off. No one has any downsides. How? What do you think? Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about that? And and you're much more likely to succeed with an approach like that. Mm -hmm. In the same way, if you have a natural ability of I don't know making portals, and and you know uh, think um, portal from uh, uh, you know portal gun from portal. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you have that ability. But, um, you know, maybe your base power doesn't allow you to do it at a distance. You have to actually physically touch the thing that you're going to create the portal in, uh, both entry and destination. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can learn to go, right, I'm going to just touch the entry and, and, and there's a destination over there that I want it to go. Maybe you can learn that over time. Mm -hmm. That's the same, that, the same sort of progression, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's how... That's how those power trees really work. Mm -hmm. Now, there's there's a when I've done interviews regarding get regarding supers games in the past, there's a handful of characters that I've used for one of my own projects to kind of demonstrate what can be done with a get with a given system. And I'd like to run that experiment by you with um with this with this particular cast. Absolutely. I've actually done nearly nearly every DC or Marvel character I could think of. Mm. I made and made sure the power tree would work. So mm. I'm quite interested. All right. In in what you've got coming. Because this was originally an this was originally an experiment with a with a um random power set generator that I had for um Mar that I had for Marvel Heroic, and then it just right. then it just expanded out from there. So. Let me get let me um get where I have it. Let's see. 
Ah, there it is. So, the... So, I... And I, I will admit that um, My Hero Academia did play a bit, did play a bit of a, a role in in how in how I structured some things, especially with having everybody's quirks be named in that series, and it's something I carried over here. So, the first one of this particular group is Finn Hako, aka Foxfire, whose his power set is ba is basically being able to do anything that you could fit you could envision a kitsune is able to do. That's more uh, that's more I'm, or less his I'm approach. Sorry, you're going to have to you're going to have to clarify that further for me. I'm I'm really not much of an anime guy. Um sorry. Kitsune is a, is a type of fox spirit in Japanese mythology. They tend to be they tend to be tricksters. They have some um they have some control when it comes to when it comes to fire, but fire and and illusion is all is a lot of their um, motif um and so that fire that, is usually that, blue okay so probably uh, so era the empowered is based around the idea that you you start as a level one character with one power tree mm -hmm. there is a fire control power tree there is an illusion power tree you probably wouldn't be able to do both at level one Although you can take parts of each, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you you might have to work out how you're dealing with... I assume the fire is real and not an illusion. And uh, the illusions are illusions and not real. Yeah. Um, so what I might do is combine the two trees and maybe make it so that the fire starts out as illusion, but you can make it real. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it, it would be doable. You'd just have to miss out on, um, you'd just have to miss out on some other tweaks that, that, you know, practicing illusion exclusively gives you, I yeah. guess, and different yeah. fire control. Um, either that, or you could do it with two power trees very easily. Yeah. Um, the next one on the list is Kyle Bridger, AKA Jet Falcon, who's... He, he's more or less a he's more or less a technomancer. The catch with it is that his abil his ability to control is dependent on underst understanding what it is he's controlling, and because right. of because of that he I I use my point of in, my point of inf of um, inspiration with him was Forge from X Men, and the oh. thing is is that he's far, he's far more of an engineer because he has to have he has to understand what he's what he's manipulating. Um, yeah, I I actually made uh, a technopath mm -hmm. who was an engineer as well, uh, very strong in the actual engineering. I actually have a pre-made character called Blueprint who has exactly those abilities. Yeah. Um. It's just that he he built a um he built a power suit that that is specifically designed to work with his. Um, particular powers, mm -hmm. one and one that's made um, modular. Right. Yep. Makes sense. So then you can switch out the bits as you put them together through technomancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You could absolutely do that. That's not a problem at all. There's a power tree in the rulebook already in the core rulebook that that does that. Yeah. Um, the next one on the list is Zaha Radamarker, aka Hardcase, who. She's kind of she's kind of a mimic, but not exa but not exactly because she can't utilize mimic powers directly. She creates constructs that use them for her. Okay. Uh, to me, that's uh, that's a minor detail. So you, you'd use the same exact mimic power tree, you know, the same uh, uh, power copying power tree. But what you'd do is you'd say, okay, and you create a construct that uses them for you. Yeah. The... It's it's a, it's almost an irrelevance. You just have to say right. The construct has this amount of health. Yeah. The That's it. the key thing is that is that it's one it's one power per construct, and yeah. as she develops, she's able to make more constructs. So she yeah. has a lot of powers yeah, stored in her head. It's just she's limited in how many she can use. Yep. 
that's an absolutely doable thing that already exists. Yeah, mm -hmm. power copying. So a tweak, minor tweak. Next is Oscar Venegas, aka Pacha Kamak, who's his his whole thing is being able to manipulate Earth, but not in not in a control the environment way, but rather to utilize it to make to make um melee weapons and armor for himself. I've got a weapon creation power tree mm -hmm. that would cover that very nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the if if the name wasn't it, if the name wasn't any indication, I went very Aztec themed with him. <laughs> yeah, I got that. Mm -hmm. uh, next is uh, but yes, the weapon creation power tree uh, uh, covers that very nicely. So that would cover weapons and armor. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Next is Aldrich Philby, aka Vibrato, who is a he is a, he is a um, shapeshifter um, to the point where he's been shapeshifting his entire life to the point where is uh, where on his I, where he's legally required to wear to wear a specialized mask so people know it's a, it's actually him <laughs> because nobody's gonna trust his nobody's going to trust his face when he can look like anybody. I'm. Uh, I made a shapeshifter who does not remember what he actually looks like. Mm -hmm. He's been shapeshifting so long. Yeah. Oh. Um, yes, absolutely. There's a there's a shapeshifting power tree which uh, uh, covers that very nicely. Um, there's even a, a character in my movie, Occupied, mm -hmm. who um, uh, who is a shapeshifter who uses that same yeah. power tree. Yeah, I, I just the monkey wrench I threw in I threw into it is that he. He's very much a theater brat. <laughs> in ter in terms of in terms of how he carries himself. Right. Oh. Uh Clayface really in um in the Batman animated uh is what comes to mind when you talk about him. Mhm. Mm oh. Cuz Clayface originally was uh uh you know in the Batman animated he was an actor. Mhm. Mm and um yeah, he he uh yeah. He 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 likes to play the role. Um, yeah. Oh, though when when I say he's a theater brat, I'm um especially going with um st stage and especially opera. He is he he does not know how to turn off his dramatic switch sometimes, and that does result that does result in him getting picked on for or um mul multiple times because well, what I drew upon was my experience dealing with theater brats because they are very easy targets. <laughs> But next on the list is Marcus Houch, aka Backdraft, who is vi his background. His his family's background is is a bunch of firefighters, and that carried over into him because he essentially he's he's essentially able to take and and rechannel um, energy effects not too far removed from say Bishop. <laughs> yep. Uh, yes, I have built Bishop. There is an energy control power tree in the uh, in the rulebook already. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, it's just, it's just that it's for him for for him. It's a it's akin to originally he thought he was just fireproof, but what was actually mm -hmm. happening was he was he absorbing was absorbing the. I. It's funny. Uh, um. It's funny because uh, I had a that there's a character who's somewhat similar in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um. He gets hit by a truck, um, and he's completely fine. The truck comes off badly. Um, fact is, he can actually absorb momentum, mm -hmm. um, and the Earth is always spinning, so he is always under momentum. He can actually feel that and will be charged up by the fact he's standing on a planet that's moving, mm -hmm. which is which is quite fun. Yeah. Um. I would pro I'd probably put in the th I prob I'd probably put in a restriction that in order to in order to use any sort of energy effect he would have to um actually get hit with it first because that's uh, yeah I mean I mean um I had uh, uh th there's actually a character who's played quite frequently by uh by one of our regular players mm -hmm. who um he can sunbathe and then accidentally shoot energy beams out of his hands mm -hmm. which is too much fun. 
<laughs> um, he, he also likes to drink, you see, because that generates energy um, within his body. Mm-hmm. So he drinks a lot, gets very drunk, and then and then says, right, well, now I've got lots of energy. What am I going to blast? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely... Uh, you can't just create energy out of nothing. It has to come from somewhere mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Marcus is a well. He's the group. He's the group's stiff neck. Safety first is is kind of his thing. <laughs> of course, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Quite the opposite of Rook, really. Yeah. But uh, next is Amelia Curtis, aka Sonic Bloom, because I wanted to do a speedster, but I didn't want to do a speedster in the uh, in the obvious manner. So the the approach that I went with instead is she creates pockets of air that she can't that she cannonballs herself through. Um, it's just that she she has a bit of a problem with the whole breaks thing. <laughs> right. Sure. Um. So basically, once she starts moving, she doesn't stop until she hits something. Or un- until she hits one of her other pockets and th- which propels her other elsewhere. It's I'd liken I'd liken these pockets of airs to boost rings that you see in a Sonic game. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so it's sort of um uh uh, uh pinball situation. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Um, yes, doable. Um, I would actually model it more like a teleporter or a you know like like I'd start from that tree. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very specific application of super speed, which obviously there's a super speed for, for blue shift. Um, it's a very specific application of it, but what I would probably do is rather than approach it from a super speed angle per se, I would approach it from a teleport angle, like you have to do a straight line, and then you can learn to make additional pockets that, that push you in another direction. Um, I think that's how I would do it, and then anything in the middle can obviously be hurt, or you can be hurt by hitting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will, I will admit, um, some of the inspiration I did, I did have was just some of the, some of the more daredevil type of type of performers. You know, the people who would be willing to ju- to jump over to jump over a bridge on, on a bike, your your Knievel family kind of things, as well as yeah, um. Are you familiar at all with with Rally Group B from back in the eighties? And I'm how? Afraid not. <laughs> um, that was a that was a division of um world of the World Rally Championship that was built with the idea of lesser restrictions to allow manufacturers that didn't sell as many as as a Porsche or Peugeot to participate. And you would end up with these monstrosities that were both supercharged and turbocharged, on with um ha- with about half the regular amount of weight. So, so it was it was definitely interesting, but also very very dangerous because because of the amount of how ho- the amount of horsepower you're putting out. Um, I imagine so. Like. And un- unfortunately, unfortunately, some people tried to touch the car as it pa- as it passed on some tracks, and um, they lost fingers. Like, I believe it. Yeah, Group B was an interesting bit of chaos, and Michelle Mouton was was some was someone who I f- I found to be an interesting story within it because she, even though she never won, she made everybody sweat. Um, and. There's also there's also the wild and crazy stories of the early years of aviation that I drew from. Is the the approach that I have with Amelia is that she she is the she is the most risk taker of the group. It's just that everybody everybody will occasionally look at her wrists as if she's crazy. Whether or not she is is yeah. a is a matter of debate. <laughs> You mean uh, uh, the panel of psychiatrists voted in the majority that she is not crazy? Nine. Uh, three to two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but next on the list is Irvine Thales, aka Hadron, who's it is gravity manipulation, but it's more built around him creating these spheres that that um 
either increase, decrease, or, re or reverse gravity? Oh, yeah, easy. No problem. I, I, yeah, I've got a, I've got a gravity control mm -hmm. power tree. So, and I, I do recall one of the more advanced things discussed was, that was that, was a control about where down is, if you catch my drift. Yes, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. Oh. The next one on the list is Carol Engel, a.k.a. Cordyceps, who... Her skin is unique in the fact that she can plant seeds within it and control the growth of those plants. Essentially a plant manipulator, but limited only to um, only to the seeds that she implants. Uh, there is a plant control power tree. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's not in the core rulebook, actually. I'd have to double-check that. I'm not sure. Um, but there is a plant control power tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I suppose that would just be a limitation to start with that for me, I would be, I would be adding a skill, perhaps, perhaps a tier two or tier three skill that lets her manipulate anything. Mm -hmm. The, uh, oh, there's, there's a, there's a bit, there was a bit of a running gag that she, that she had, that she had, that she would make these very health, healthy, um, um, er herbal herbal blends, but um, they're cer they're certainly healthy, but they taste absolutely horrid. <laughs> yeah, standard. You know the, you know like tr like trying to like trying to like the first time you you drank a bottle of V eight and it was a and it was absolutely nasty. Yep, I know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one is Thorvald Eriksson, aka Thrudgelmir. Who orig originally we just had it that he that he's just able to control his size and go and grow giant size, but since that that felt a that felt a little bit too that felt a little bit like it didn't go far enough, we expand we expanded to the idea that his his bo his body is significantly more dense. Uh, yep. It does mean that if you weighed him, he'd he'd weigh like. Despite despite him not looking the part, he'd weigh like seven hundred pounds just because everything's so much more packed in. It's also the sure. reason why um, most most um, most standard caliber bullets just bounce off him because because well like they can't pierce. It still hurts like hell, but it can't but it can't pierce. So I've got a body manipulation power tree. And a size changing power tree, mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of separated. But no, that that one is very natural for those two to come together um, and produce a power tree for that. But yeah, it would not be hard. You'd know exactly which bits of which you wanted. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, again, both in the core rulebook. And something I should ask when it comes to the power tree is when when you've had people make characters, uh, do they end, do they end up filling out the second and third tiers of the power tree at character creation or do they fill yeah. that in um, as the campaign goes on? So at character creation, um, you get 10 points to spend. Mm -hmm. So it helps a lot if you know your entire power tree. However, sometimes, for some characters, I've deliberately left spaces blank so you don't know what that power is, and then we'll explore it during, during the campaign, and we'll suddenly realize, oh, it's this, it's got to be this, it was clearly always this. Mm-hmm. But we'd never understood that that was that was what it was. Yeah. And the other thing that you that you've really brought up in some of the Kickstarter updates is the seven eras that you ha that you have the seven yeah. events. Um, yeah. How how did that particular thing come about? So, um, we've spoken about era of the consortium before, haven't we? Yeah. Um. And the five hundred years of history. Are you know that they're, they're really they're really core to the way that I see that game being you know being played. Um, you know, you you really can play any subgenre of sci-fi, mm -hmm. and the same is true of Era of the Empowered. You know, um, that there are fewer, sure, there are fewer events, fewer number of years, even, 
But there are certain things that happen in, you know, most superhero franchises at some point. And I really wanted to offer the opportunity to to do all of those things. So, you know, you, you want to do Ra's al Ghul decided that he's going to kill everyone. Okay, cool. Yep, let's do that. Or even, um, you could even do, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the run of comics was called. When uh, uh, Batman's contingency for all of the Justice League came out. Um, you, you know what I mean, right? I forget what the I name believe, is now. I believe, that was, I, believe that was the, I believe that was the OMAC event. I don't remember the, ex, the exact name, but that was... That was the fa that was the factor. That was also where you had um, brother I. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean that that was a possibility. Um, uh, there's um, I'm sure they did a movie of that actually that particular occasion. I just don't remember what the movie's called. Anyway, um, so there's that, or there's you know Atlantis. You know, uh, Atlanteans suddenly appear on the surface, angry. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've not seen the new Black Panther yet, but I hear that, 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 you know, that, that happens in that, at least to some degree. Um, you know, there's, that there are things that happen where, you know, you, you, you might decide you want to be a group that's like even the first group to team up as heroes, you know, the, the first Avengers movie, if you like, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is too much for any one of us. We've got to team up. Um, you might want to have an alien invasion. You might want to have... Um, uh, how about um, empowered or, or, or the people who were gods 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, whatever. Um, those people are actually empowered. They were, you know, and they return. They reappear. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's really important to give all of these options for gameplay. Um, the government taking over and as... Leo voiced wonderfully in the uh, in the video. When did a government ever do anything illegal? Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Yeah. I, I, and I. I really wanted to give that that opportunity for anyone who wanted to play. To play anything, mm -hmm. you know. You, you. I've had people play Golden Age stuff. I've had people, uh, uh, if you kept up with the Calcops thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is on our YouTube and also was in some of the updates. Um, you know, I've I've run campaigns in each of the events. Um, my favorite is actually event four. I, I really enjoy the old gods stuff. You know, you're, you think you're the most powerful people on the planet and then people who are so experienced and so in control of their abilities, they make you look like infants playing with toys. Mm-hmm appear and just say right we rule the world you can do what we want thank you mm -hmm. oh by the way don't fight back or we'll have to kill everyone mm -hmm. um it's 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 a fun it's a fun scenario for me as a gm to come up with a car uh, sort of a campaign within yeah so yeah that's that's why those exist they exist to give you options for the flavor to give you a framework that you can use if you want to um, you can even progress through the events over time if you like, and and that's one of the things that uh, that we offer with the uh, pre-made sessions that yeah. we've given. Do you see the do you see the event do you see the events as your own as your own equivalent to event comics? Um, no, the the events are actually a description of the entire universe. Mm -hmm. So. The, the, the seven events are more like, here is the Bronze Age of comics. It is, is more what it's akin to. It's every, everything that happens, happens within that, that time period. And then at the end of it, I'm sorry to tell you, um, the Empowered do not come out looking too good. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an intense ending for the timeline. Um, in event seven, mm -hmm. um, and it probably doesn't go the way most people would expect it to. I think. Mm -hmm. No more spoilers than that. That's the best you're getting. <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously. Um, over, over the past f over the past five years, that's there's a lot of opportunities to ha to have various learning experiences within the setup. Um. What would you say were some of the biggest learning experiences you had 
within um the, within the development of of the empowered specifically the the biggest experience and this is surprising i think but the biggest learning experience for me was that i was right like i, I you know i i I made a superhero game, I looked at other super games, I put it out into the world, and I said, it's supposed to do these things, and it's not supposed to do these things, well, unless you do this, this, and this, you know, you're only supposed to have one power unless you have a second power tree, for example. And it does those things consistently for every group that plays it. It's not, it's not trying to do anything that it's not trying to do. It's not trying to model super, uh, Silver Age Superman, because damn it's it's trying to make everyone feel like everyone can contribute so it's not massively unbalancing so that one person can save the day every time but it gives everyone their unique abilities and every power tree has if you apply it right the opportunity to really change the face of the scenario that you're playing Mm -hmm. It's about learning about your power tree and learning how to apply it. And given that, I was actually quite surprised that it that it was right, that it worked, that it actually was correct. Um, because I, I I didn't really go in going yeah 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 this is all good. I went in going right. Well, I'm 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 giving this a go and we'll see how it goes and hopefully it's all right. But it's become a firm favorite among, you know, our players. Mm -hmm. uh, people, people, you know, come up to us at conventions or 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 onto our Discord server to play Era the Empowered specifically, yeah. um, and it's. I think it's because we have shown people that you can be the superhero that you want to be. And I'd I'd imagine that what what it what has helped is not is not doing the link the um lengthy list of powers powers and drawbacks to the point where you have to um you have you have to break out the graphing calculator in in some cases because superhero games and universalist games have had a a very joined at the hip relationship for decades. Um, one one of them's not too far from the other, and in something like Champions, well, one became the other. <laughs> yeah. But in a lot of in a but because of the fact that that it's built around these powers, these advantage and drawback systems, you end up with the same problem that Universalist games have, where things can get out of hand very quickly, or you need two or three session, z session zeros and by that point it becomes less of a game and more of a cry for help. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I never wanted to create something that was the traditional superhero game. I wanted to do it my way with the Era D10 rule set which is, which is my way of approaching role-playing games. And I wanted to create a universe that we could explore and enjoy, that we could build comics in and audio dramas and, and movies and whatever else we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I just did the thing that I wanted. I didn't try to make it cover every single thing that anyone might want to do. Which is smart because I've... I've seen a, I've seen a lot of approaches trying to try and do the kitchen sink approach. Of tr of trying to trying to encompass a a whole a whole universe's wor worth of material, and the problem when you do that is you is that it's very easy to collapse under your own weight. Yeah, everything that I make is more like a scaffolding than a building. Mm -hmm. It's it's space for you to build your own thing. And I've got the support there if you want it, or you can just build out on your own if that's what you'd rather do. Yeah, I've considering that a lot that a lot of people that work that have worked with me have um got in got into comics through X Men. Instead of trying to fight the river, I've tried to le lean right into it, which is why something like here 
uh, My Hero Academia was such a um, boon for me because it made my job so much easier. Since in both mm-hmm. cases you're dealing with young heroes trying to le- trying to learn their powers, that if that doesn't scream um, the the um, entry point for level one character for level one characters within a group, I don't know what does. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree with you one hundred percent. And obviously, 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 things expand out from from there, and and each has their own forms forms of forms of ridiculous. But if you're involved, if you're involved in comics in general and superhero comics, and you're not expecting ridiculous, what are you doing? <laughs> that's that's things I find funny about uh, uh, sometimes when I when I run a game. Someone go, but that doesn't sound realistic, and I'm like. That dude over there can shoot fire out of his eyes. Shut up. I've <laughs> I, one of my mantras for the longest time has been believability over realism. That if you're gonna do yeah. if you're gonna do ridiculous stuff, um, at least give it some degree of grounding. Some if you're gonna have rules, well, that, make sure you follow them. It, it's funny because I've never put it that way, but that is more or less what the power tree system is trying to do in Era the Empowered, right? Mm-hmm. It's trying to say, right, you can shoot fire out of your eyes, okay? That that's what you can do. That's that's your thing. You you, you can do this. Um, don't don't try and like make ice out of nothing. It it doesn't make sense. That's not part of your powers, right? So yeah, I mean, it's it's that as you say, it's that believability. It's that. I'm willing to suspend my disbelief because I have this party who can do this and this and this and this and this. This one can turn invisible and walk through walls. This one can, I don't know, uh, run super fast. Uh, this one, and so on. And you go, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And and those are the things they can do. Yeah. And 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 if you're willing to believe that they can do those things then within what you can believe they can do as a result of having that as a natural ability, you then build a power tree. Mm-hmm. And to th- to that e- to that end, the other reason I the other reason I do I do this whole believability over realism is the way people I find the way people approach realism in game design, whether whether as pl- whether as players, GMs, or in some cases designers, is so is um so very reductionist to the to the sandbox that is role playing games because in a, in a lot of times people and I've seen this with with both um with both role playing games and I really have seen have seen this the last few years when it comes to um sim and simcade racing video games focusing on the wrong things like the to use the to use the racing game example folk putting putting years amount of time to have the most realistic puddle reflections is something that only a only a select few are going to care about i talk a lot about this in audio um because i uh, i work with the the absolutely brilliant leo kosh mm-hmm. who is extremely experienced in audio and he'll go, oh, but the 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 sound quality of this is X. You know, it's 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 at this this sample rate or whatever. And I'll go, okay. And the difference between that and and the sample rate that you that you'd like to use is is negligible, and no one is going to know the difference unless they're an audio professional. Yeah, it's it's like okay, you know, like I get that would be the ideal. The barrier to get there is like twelve hours and re-recording of stuff and so on and so on and so on. Maybe we just ought to call it good because ninety-nine percent of people are not even going to notice. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's like what you're saying um, with the with the yeah the the most realistic puddle reflections. It's like okay, um, people sacrifice. Game development is particularly guilty of this. Sacrificing good gameplay or, or good AI or whatever for amazing graphics. And there are some games out there with breathtakingly good graphics. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, what I actually want is a good experience when playing the game. And as long as the graphics aren't terrible, me personally, I don't care. Yeah. Not that much. Like, I, I played GoldenEye again 
uh, a friend of mine has um has a Switch, and uh, and he let me play Goldeneye with my GameCube controller, which was weird. Um, and uh, you know what? I didn't. I, okay, the graphics are a bit blocky. You can see what the people are supposed to be. You can see the guns. You can see the bullets mm -hmm. and the fire and the you know it's fine. Like it's it's completely fine for me. It's not a problem. Yeah. Oh, um, it's only I, a I problem if somebody I picks our job. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, our job is there for the people who can't actually play. <laughs> uh, the people who can actually play insist you play multiplayer in stack and take the jungle commando. Because you can't, you can't see the jungle commando in stack because the bottom half of the... Bottom half of the wall is green, and he's green, and they blend in. You cannot see him at all. Um, back in the day, we had we had a bit we had a bit of a rule that um, if you if you pick if you picked odd if you picked odd job, then after after the set, um, you would have to drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh, okay. That that wow. was how I prevented uh, people from playing odd job. That the that make the punishment worse than the crime. That that's that that is quite bad, because <laughs> it's exa it's exactly as b the bacon soda thing is something I found at a, at a specialty candy shop, and it's exactly as bad as you think it is. It is, it is it, absolutely it disgusting. Awful. Yeah, which which um, is kind. You know the saying, "One sword keeps another in the sheath." That yeah, was yeah. that was kind of the point. Make the punishment so terrible that nobody would think of trying it. I always thought it was so weird that Odd Job was short, because in the movie he's not short. He's stocky. Like he's quite a big guy. Like he's he's not short even. He he is definitely stocky, but he's also not really short. Like he's about the same height as Sean Connery, right? <sighs> the be the best the it's been asked around multiple times, and the and the most consistent response is that it may have been a programming error, which oh. Uh... Given how slap, yeah, given maybe. how slapdash some some of the pro some of the programming Especially was back the, in the day. In the multiplayer, yeah. Well, I mean, the Goldeneye multiplayer was very slapdash. It was last minute, mm -hmm. not supposed to be included, kind of thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. I, I I can see that. I can see that. That makes sense. And um. I mean, obviously, they doubled down on it in Perfect Dark and just gave you Elvis's body. Um. I think it's because by that point, did it. It had become such a meme that they decide they decided yeah. instead of fighting instead of fighting the current, just swim with it. Of course, of course, yes, Perfect absolutely. Dark also had the absolutely. laptop guns, so they. Yeah. Did. I mean, I, I I adore Perfect Dark. I I, I spent years playing that game. Um, absolutely adore it. One of yeah. my favorites of all time. Yeah, it's just every every game is going every game I believe is going to have that going to have that build or that strategy that. Um, get that gets abused and and everyone hates in in some form. Oh yeah. Um. Oh yeah, definitely. When I was playing th when I was playing third edition, everybody hated the sorcerers I'd build because instead of building around a bunch of different spells, I would I would just ha I would just um mess around with meta magic. So, th so the um. So you have so fireball and then silent fireball and then. No movement fireball, and then maximize fireball. I would, I would, fireball, I would and... have it where I would cast magic missile in the hundreds. <laughs> yeah. You know, just a hundred and twenty-four magic bolts of magic missile going up against the B bag, and since I mean, it's that's... Hmm? that's the right way of doing it, isn't it? Uh, or the, the only problem is the only problem is that magic missile. Mm -hmm. All you need is a shield, and you're okay. So, because mm -hmm. in third. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, magic missile was entirely deflected by shield. If you had a shield, magic missile did zero damage. Yeah. Um, no when, I, when, how I'd many play, when I'd played, when I played, the problem with Isaac's lesser and greater yeah. missile storms. Mm -hmm. In in uh, Magic: The Gathering, an easy way to get everybody to hate you is to play sliver decks. <laughs> yep. Right. Or the rainbow decks that I would play in the Mirrodin block, Mirrodin block that people really hated. Uh, most mostly because it was, I basically found a way to to, to turn the to turn the Mirrodin block into a um a Zerg rush on steroids by using a bunch of cards that would get whose power deter was determined by how many different colors 
of um, lands you used. So it would have these right. artifacts that would keep spewing out like five five tokens every round, and just keep doing it more and more until until I've got like twenty or so out, and 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 the other guy just flips the table because there's no way he can match it. You know, technically speaking, I didn't break any of the rules, and I'll even even in real sport even in real sports, there's there's cases of that. There's the in, there's in American football, there was the infamous holy roller rule that was so dumb, but ended up ended up working, and then it got banned <laughs> the day afterwards. Oh, in in baseball, there was an incident of a switch hitter and a switch pitcher um, at the at on the field, and the two kept switching sides for about a minute until the Elms had to stop everything to try and figure out how we're, how they were going to resolve this because. Technically speaking, they didn't break any rules. <laughs> yeah. Because who could who could have predicted the idea that you'd have two position two ambidextrous positions opposite each other at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> well, any any game designer could have predicted it. Oh. Poss possibly, but the but we're dealing with rules that are over a hundred years old, so oh. cut them a little bit of slack. Of course. Of, of course. No, no, no. Absolutely. I mean, but uh, any 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 game designer worth worth buying from is uh, has, has has thought of those sorts of things. Um, I think. Yeah, and in Halo Two, there was the inf there was the whole BXR thing, which um, ended up changing how the battle rifle was was supposed to be used. Because the battle rifle was supposed to be a jack of all trades weapon, but because of BXR, it became a close range weapon, since. It was basically melee, then ca cancel the post hit animation, and then shoot. And you'd take and you could take people out stupid fast if you could get the timing right. If you didn't get the timing right, then you just you'd just be open and you'd be full you'd be full of holes in about five seconds. But it there's all there's always those there's always those kind of things. It's also it's the reason why I always laugh whenever people whenever people talk up about um, about game balance. I don't think it's unnecessary, but I think but I think it but there it's a case of knowing when to when to step in and when not to. Because if something yeah if you if something was discovered by accident by my players, it's best to to let it be as long as it's as long as it's not um r as long as it's not taking up too much space within the. Um, game's sandbox. Yep, I agree. Because people with enough experience, they're they're gonna figure these things out, and trying to sh trying to shut that down is ju is just going to give you more problems than it's worth. Yeah, um, I I agree one hundred percent with that. Definitely. And I'm I wouldn't be surprised if you if if you had if in over the years with both era the empowered and era in general you had a few instances of of something um something that people discovered that you didn't account for at the time early on um i had a bunch of mathematicians uh as my original group and they tried to break everything so um, one of them, one of them discovered a problem very early on and made an un unkillable character. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that there were there were problems around what stats. Um, this actually came out because uh, uh, one of the podcasts who was running here at the consortium gave specific weapons to the like weapon upgrade parts to their group. And unfortunately, um, these basically unbalanced the game because it was anything that reduces a hit threshold is automatically absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons. You know, you're rolling a d10 and if you're no longer rolling for sevens, but always rolling for sixes, you are phenomenally better at combat based on that. Um, and that led me, you know, that led me to write an article about GMs. Hey, feel free to homebrew. Feel free to play. Yeah, that's fine. Here are some things you really need to think about if you're going to do them. Mm -hmm. Like, think about these really carefully before you start doing them. 
Which um, is for, but it... no, uh, I I sort of I had my game broken a lot of times very early on, and very few people have really done anything that actually breaks anything anymore. Um, I, I I think I think it got attacked by the right kind of people very early on. <laughs> Probably. But now I do want to I do want to offer my congratulations on how well the Kickstarter ended up doing. Um, since at the time of this recording, it's at it's at let's see, um, two point two thousand pounds, and you were asking for fifteen hundred. That's um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I tr I try my best to co to convert to the original cur to the original currency. Otherwise, you end up with some weird ass numbers. Um, uh, you do rather, don't you? Mm -hmm. Um, and with with that in mind, what what would you be shooting for as far as a re release window for the, for this version of Era the Empowered? So usual um i've made a commitment that is very 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 safe um i think and i'm just gonna double check because i actually don't remember i think i said um where are we that's... october 2024 mm -hmm. uh which honestly is crazy pants um i would be surprised if it's not done by the end of the year and and in everyone's hands I would like to get it to everyone for Christmas, um, and there may even be a possibility... Mm, not quite. Uh, not quite Halloween, perhaps Thanksgiving in the US, and certainly Christmas. If I'm not doing that, I would be quite disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, because most of the work is done. It's There's a little bit of layout to do, um, sticking stuff in. There's a little bit of rewriting to do on a few bits that that i would like to just tweak um but i mean that's like minimal amounts of work and then it does have to be re-indexed of course because i've added 60 pages to a 300 page book mm -hmm. uh, which my indexer is not going to thank me for to say the least um yeah, yeah. so other than that I really expect this not to take very long at all. Um, I'd like to believe I could be done with production in another month or so. And then printing does take about a month uh, mm -hmm. for a hardback of this size. And then, yeah, then sending out. Yeah, because the, well, the original was was just shy, was, um, I believe, just shy of 300 pages. That's right, 298. Mm-hmm. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you once again for taking the time to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Uh, thank you very much for having me, as always. It's it's always a pleasure to come here and, and spend some time with you, Mildred. Mm -hmm. um, I hope to be back again really soon. Yep. And any t anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say thank around you. here... Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>